Yeah, so today I'm going to, to give an introduction to RISC-V. Uh, so given that this is only one hour, I of course cannot cover everything in depth. Uh, there is a lot more content in the slides than I will probably be able to present that. So you can maybe later on look up stuff in more, like in a bit more detail if you want. Uh, but otherwise, and I come to this, um, you're of course invited to read the standard. It's, it's open where I come to that. Um, and it's actually pretty readable. So it's actually possible to read it even as somebody who doesn't have any clue about the hardware behind it. Um, so what is risk five uh, on one slide just to get started uh, and to, to set the scene. Um, so risk five is an, um, is an open standard instruction set architecture is not, uh, so they kind of try to not say that they are open source. So what is open source is uh, are the specifications. For the specifications, they are hosted in the GitHub repository um, and they are, they are open. You can just download them. You can look at the development version. Uh, you can look at proposed standard extensions and so on. Um, and you, vendors can, can just use them and not pay for it. So there are no royalty fees that you have to pay to somebody, for example, as we know it from ARM. Um, but the important thing is that the risk five cores, the individual, um, uh, the cores that are actually available in hardware, they can either be open or proprietary, where of course, if a company invests significant R&D effort into something, then probably they want to sell it. So they won't make the, the, the most performant one, probably those won't be open source. Um, so risk five was started uh, at the University of California, Berkeley in uh, 2010. Uh, I come uh, to that as a research project initially. Um, and since 2020, RISC-5, uh, so the standard is published by RISC-5 International, uh, relo which, which relocated to Switzerland. Um, and the very interesting uh, property that RISC-5 has is that it has a modular design. So there is a base instruction set architecture with very few integer instructions. And then there are many standard extensions that you can basically put on top of this to implement floating point, uh, floating point support, uh, later on vector support, or everything else that you want to put on top of this. But the base ISA is very, very small. Um, and this modular design also makes it that in principle, you can have normal uh, application processes, but you can also explicitly target it towards embedded system or to very specialized systems just by selecting which instructions are important for the application domain that you want to run on it. Um, so today, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to start with, uh, with some background, uh, like where, what, what is risk, uh, what is the risk part of risk five, uh, a bit of history, and then we'll go into the, into the ISA itself. Um, and, of course, one of the interesting things, of course, when we are in the Computer Accelerator Forum, uh, are the RISC-V vector extensions um, for, I think, obvious reasons why they are interesting. Um, so let's start with the background. I, for, for questions, uh, I will ask basically after uh, everyone, uh, after every of those um, parts, uh, if there are immediate questions to that, maybe I can take them at that point. And then of course, at the end, you can, you can ask uh, whatever. Um, but some of the content in there is not extremely linear, so some of the con some of the con some of the connections only become clear after I've presented the the the, uh, the individual part. Um, okay, so let's start with the with the with the background. So what is RISC? RISC uh, is, a, is an acronym for Reduced Instruction Set Computer, and that's a term. Um, proposed or coined by David Patterson, Professor David Patterson from the Berkeley Risk Project in the 1980s. Uh, and the idea is that there are only very simple instructions for some definition of simple uh, that can be executed faster because it can be pipelined. And where there is reduced, there's also the complex instruction set architecture that was basically the um, the predominant um, way of designing instruction sets uh, at that time uh, for the, and then uh, you had very complex instructions that maybe did many operations at once, for example, memory load, an arithmetic operation, then a memory store back uh, of the result. Um, and if you bought one of the very expensive CPUs, this was implemented in hardware. If you bought one of the cheaper designs, this was implemented with microcode at 
a bit of performance penalty in terms of simpler operations. Um, so as one example, that's just uh, x86 assembly. Yeah, you won't get around to, uh, of all um, assembly code. So there will be some assembly code. I've tried to reduce it as much as possible. Um, but okay, so the add instruction is, um, uh, it lo first loads the, the, the content that is at the, at the address pointed to by the RDI uh, register, then adds two and writes the result back to, to, the, to, the, to the memory location. So that's basically three operations in some sense in, in, in one uh, instruction. Um, notable architectures uh, today that are important, still important today for risk is uh, ARM, uh, that probably most people know from the, from the smartphone world maybe, uh, the IBM power uh, architecture, and then of course RISC-V. Uh, for CISC, we have of course x86, um, and also the IBM Z mainframe, I think is the second most important CISC architecture that we still have, uh, that we still have today. Um, so what does reduced mean? Uh, so I said for some definition of simple. So reduced does certainly not mean few instructions. So just as an example, I looked at ARM v9, which is the, the latest standard uh, for ARM. So that has 402 base instructions, 404 SIMD and floating point instructions, and 700 something SV instructions. So by no means that is a small instruction set, but still ARM is a risk instruction set. Um, Neither does it mean only simple operations, as in uh, only something which you can trivially do in, in, with, a, with, a, with a hardware adder or with a hard, hardware multiplier unit. So for example, there are instructions for the floating point square root, both in ARM and RISC-V. Uh, ARM has instructions for hashing, so for, uh, for, for, very, for actually at least three hashing algorithms that I could find. Uh, Risk five also has them in the in the standard extension for for cryptography, um, so that's also not it. Um, and today, more or less, what re, uh, what risk is supposed to mean is load store architectures. Um, so originally, uh, like risk was meant as uh, what was as I said was for this risk. Um, uh, project at the University of California in 1980s. That's where the term comes from. And today, more or less, it is used as an equivalent of load store architectures. So what are load store architectures? Um, it's actually pretty simple. So the load store architectures means that uh, instruction falls into one of two categories. Either instructions load or store to memory, or an instruction is performing an operation between registers. Um, and there is no, for example, what I showed before, there is no add that first loads from memory, then does something and writes it back, with one exception. Um, but basically, all operations, like all computation operations, they are performed between registers. And that's why also sometimes you can, you can find it as a register, register architecture. And in contrast to that, x86 is a register memory architecture for probably also um, for, for also um, obvious reasons is that you can have registers and memory addressing together in one instruction. Uh, so just as an example, I already had the add uh, with, with loading and storing and in RISC-V, for example, so that's actually RISC-V assembly code. You first load something to a register, then you add an, an immediate number to the register and then you store it back. So that's the clear separation between load store instructions and basically everything else that is operating on registers. Um, so is there, I don't know if there's already questions for the background. Um, not then I will go on. Um, so as I said, so originally risk comes from the, um, from, from the risk one project in, in the 1980s. And then when there is a risk one, there's maybe also a risk two. And in fact, risk five, the, the, the V in there is for the fifth generation of risk uh, ISA designs at Berkeley. Um, so that all started in May, 2010 at the Power Lab in uh, University of California, Berkeley uh, by Professor Azanovich. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that name correctly uh, with graduate students, Lee and Waterman together with David Patterson. And that name is not a coincidence. That's the same Patterson that also led the RISC-1 project. And he will come up again later again. 
Uh, so he is the director of, he's also a professor still at University of California, Berkeley, and he's the director of the PAR lab. So basically he's the, the um, yeah, he's above uh, Professor Zonovich. Um, and uh, so originally this was meant to be like those, those usual projects, supposed to be a summer project. Yeah, we will do this one summer. We need an, IS, an open ISA for, for our research thing. We just do it over the summer and then we are done. Um, as we know now, that's 13 years ago, so it's still ongoing. So the first publication of the uh, instruction set was in May 2011 uh, with this official title here. Uh, and also later that month was the first tape out of a real risk five chip in 28 nanometers. Uh, so basically that was the first time that uh, an actual hardware chip with the risk five uh, ISA existed. That was also already in May, 2011. Um, at some point, it was recognized that this is useful and useful beyond only uh, research control. Um, so uh, the RISC-V Foundation was launched um, and all the original authors, they transferred the rights to the RISC-V fund, uh, Foundation. Um, so the RISC-V Foundation steers the development and the ratification of RISC-V and you have to be a member in order to take part in the standardization process uh, of, of the RISC-V ISA. But after it's ratified, everything is published uh, free of charge. You can just go download it. Uh, you can use it as much as you want. Uh, basically, that is also free for uh, external members. I think there is something you have to be a corporate member in order to, uh, to, to, to claim that you are certified and that you are compliant and so on. Um, but that's probably for the companies out there. Um, in 2019, it was decided that to alleviate uncertainty about the geopolitical landscape, they would relocate from the US to Switzerland. Um, and that's done since March, 2020. So it was renamed Risk 5 International Association. And since then is, is incorporated in, as under Swiss law. Uh, so what's the current status? The first uh, ratified and frozen uh, ISA was in December, 2019. So that's basically the guarantee that going forward, the ISA is not going to change in a backward incompatible way. Uh, that included the base integer instruction set and some standard extension. I will come back to this. And since then, a number of extensions have been ratified. So in 2011, for, for bit manipulation, half precision floating point and vector, uh, that's only an excerpt that there are, there are more, but those were maybe the, the, the more interesting ones, uh, especially the vector ones, we will take another look at later. And then some more in 20, uh, 2022, 2023. Um, uh, and the more important, in my opinion, more important addition this year is profile. So basically uh, with all those extensions, it's getting hard to keep track of what is actually implemented where. Uh, so basically profiles is a group of, uh, of a base ASA and mandatory extensions. So basically um, there is a profile um, that says I have this uh, base ISA and have this set of extensions. And if you say, that, uh, if you if you, you can kind of use it as a, as a shortcut and then you uh, uh, you know which, ex uh, which extensions you can use on that. Uh, and also some expectations regarding uh, atomic instructions of what you can expect from a compliant hardware to, to fulfill. Uh, Toolchain support that's mainly for looking up. So basically around the 2017, 2018 um, was when, when the Linux part got up to speed. And uh, since July, 2023, uh, so actually two months ago, uh, RISC-V is now an official Debian architecture that will be officially released with the next Debian release in two years. That's the ex expectation. Okay. Um, Unless there are other questions. Yes. Any comment about the uh, previous open architectures or comparison to power? Because I think it was also open in ISA, right? Isn't it? Yes, so, I think power is also open. And how did it become a thing? Like, I mean, it, there was already something open. How... Yes, there was also some, already something open. Actually, the most open risk architecture was called Open Risk, uh, very creative name. Um, I don't remember the exact reasons by heart, but basically, uh, the standard gives some reasoning of why that one was not um, 
uh, was not appropriate for that research project uh, and why they decided to to do something uh, something new. Uh, one of the ideas was that they wanted to come up with something as minimal in the base as possible. Uh, so we actually see that there are in the very base instruction set architecture, there are only 40 instructions, uh, which is very little compared to what it was there available at that point. Uh, but yeah, so in the standard, there's a big rationally on, on why they didn't go that way, like why they didn't go to extend an already existing one. Yes, I mean, of course, maybe it's easier to do from scratch. And also, I, I mean, I see the, the appeal as a research project, of course. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah, but since then, I mean, it's, it's, become, it's becoming bigger than only the research project. I mean, so it, it did something right. Um, okay, so let's start getting, unless there are other questions, then let's start getting into the, into the, into the actual ISA. Um, as I said, some of the slides are contain more information than I will I will read out loud. If you want to go back to them, that's of course meant as a as a reference, and otherwise you have to go read the standard. Um, so everything basically starts with RV thirty two I. So RV is of course for RISC five. Uh, thirty two is for thirty two bit, and I is for the integer. So that's the base integer instruction set, um, and that's the starting point. So the, the uh, this instruction, uh, based integer instruction set has uh, defines that there are 32 registers uh, called X0 to X31. Uh, there are some aliases. All of them are 32 bits wide and X0 is a special one. If you read from X0, you get zero back. If you write to X0, nothing happens. Um, there is a 32 bit instruction coding. So all instructions are four bytes long. Um, Except for the C extensions, we will come back to that later. Um, and as I said, there are 40 instructions in this. So you have uh, 21 integer instructions for computation. So addition, subtraction between registers and also of small immediate values. You have shifts, left, right, arithmetic, logical. You have logical operations and or XOR uh, between, um, between registers. Uh, you have uh, of course, you need jumps and conditional branches. Uh, you have load and store. So we, remember RISC-5 is, is a load store architecture. So we have that separated between the register register operations and the load store instructions. So we have eight load and store instructions for words. So 32 bit for half words or 16 bit and for bytes or so eight bit. And we have four additional, uh, so memory ordering uh, environment call and breakpoint instruction. Sorry, three, of course. Uh, and that's it. Um, so I would like to point out one thing, for example, which you may be wondering why it's not there. For example, even the base integer instruction set does not contain an integer multiplication. Uh, so it's that minimal that it doesn't have uh, an integer multiplication. Um, so then, uh, yeah, please. Just curious, why is it a good idea to waste one register on zero? Um, good question. Um, I think the idea is that you have 32 of them anyway. <laughs> um, I think it makes some, um, some, uh, so basically the way that you materialize constants in risk five is that you immediate uh, add to the X zero uh, register and write that into something else. So that way, if you want to load immediate, like the value two, you add immediate uh, two to the X zero register, which is always zero and store it to something else. Uh, and that I think makes it convenient. I think that's the reasoning. Uh, yes, please. So, uh, Steven, you have your hand up. Uh, yes. So I'm also fascinated by this, um, by this zero register. So I didn't know about this, um, but it's a clever way of doing things, but I'm curious because you said you can also write to it, and I'm, I'm assuming that this is sort of the way to dump values that you don't need. Um, but is the, is the CPU front-end aware of the special meaning of X0, and can it avoid pipeline bubbles, or is this something that you need to take care of as you develop for risk five? Yes, I mean, the ISA in the end doesn't care, <laughs> because that's the micro, like the actual microarchitecture uh, that is behind it. But yes, that's, of course, the idea that um, the the microarchitecture and the front end can already optimize for some things if, if some things are not needed. For example, 
uh, also there is a so also there is no no operation in included in here a no operation is canonically defined as adding the immediate zero to the zero register and writing it back to the zero register uh, so that's the encoding of a nop operation but there's no in like no separate instruction for doing that um, and yes the the micro like clever microarchitectures are, exp are expected to recognize this pattern and optimize on it yes Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, then, of course, somebody decided that uh, some, some time ago decided that maybe four gigabytes of RAM is not enough. So we go into 64 bits. Um, so that we get to the RV64i. Um, so this is based on the RV32i. Uh, and it just takes all the 32 registers and says, okay, they are now 64 bit wide. And then it adds some instructions basically for efficiency reasons on computations for computations on 32 bits. In principle, you could do this also with 64 bit and then some clever masking and, and shifting around, but basically they are separate ones. And of course you need loads and stores of double words, 64 bit values. Um, okay, but you add 15. So now we are at 55 for the, for the 64 bit base. Um, then we have three that I just have here for completeness. So we have um, E instructions. So they are reduced versions of the I instruct uh, of the I uh, base instruction sets. Um, they just have the number of registers with the observation that for embedded for embedded systems, maybe that is enough to have 16. And it saves quite a bit of, uh, of space on the for, for a simple chip. Um, and there is because maybe 64 bit at some point is also not going to be enough. Um, there is R, uh, RV128i, uh, which basically extends RV64i to 128 bit uh, registers and also 128 bit um, uh, load and store instructions. Uh, that's for future exploration. I at some point heard that was meant more, more or less as a joke. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, the specification is not frozen at the moment. It's just there that if at some point it's needed, it's going to be that one. Uh, so they're not going to do some funny 96 bit or something, uh, but it's going to be 128 bit. Okay, so that was the base. Uh, now we put uh, um, now we put extensions on top of this, and I already mentioned it before. There is no integer multiplication in the base ISA, so we have an M standard extensions for integer multiplication and division. So that just adds eight or 13 new instructions for RV32 or RV64 uh, for integer multiplication and integer division and remainder operations. And that's the whole instruction set uh, extension. Okay, so the next one is atomic instructions, which is also not present in the base ISA. Um, so there are two types of, uh, of uh, instructions for atomic operations. There is load store, uh, load reserved store conditional um, instructions. I will explain in a second, in a second what, it, what that is. And there are atomic fetch and uh, fetch and operate memory instructions. So that's, I personally, when preparing the slides, I actually think that goes against the risk idea, right? Because you basically have an instruction that does both. But I kind of see that uh, that's maybe, it's maybe the, so, it may be needed for scalable systems to kind of violate this risk idea at that point. Um, so we get 11 or, 30, uh, or 22 new instructions. So you get two for load reserved and store conditional and you get no, uh, nine uh, atomic memory operations, um, basically atomically swapping, atomically integer addition, uh, atomically logical operations and uh, signed, unsigned maximum and minimum of, of two values. Uh, the requirement is that uh, it has to be naturally aligned. So, um, if there is uh, so in the in RV32 on 32-bit values, it has to be aligned on 30 so on a four-byte boundary. Uh, if it's not aligned, then there are then the basically the the A the A extension doesn't make any any guarantees on what's going to happen. But there are basically more. Uh, there's an extra extension which says what's going to happen for misaligned atomic accesses. Um, Yes. Yes. Um, so, what is this load reserve store conditional loop? Um, so, basically, those. Are, so, there are two ways, uh, maybe three, of how you can implement uh, log-free data structures or 
generally that you can that you need for um, uh, for for atomic instructions. Uh, so x86 has this compare and set instruction. So you atomically uh, compare a value and then atomically uh, set it uh, on that memory value uh, on that memory location. And some other instruction set architectures and also other risk architectures, they chose this load, re load reserved store conditional loops. Um, again, I won't go into the details here. The, rational, the, the standard has like a one and a half page rationally on, on why that is the better fit and why it is potentially more efficient. Um, and also just to show it's like you can emulate compare and set with these LRSC loops. Uh, so we now have the second uh, time we have assembly. Uh, I'm just going to use it to explain also how this uh, LRSC loop works. Um, so basically imagine this is, so it's assembly instruction and uh, assume that this is a function call that can be called. Uh, so you have a couple of arguments. So these A0, A1, A2, uh, those are aliases of the, of the X registers. So just think of those as, as registers. And then what you do is you load reserved um, from the memory address A, which holds the, which is the memory location, you load the original value and store it into a temporary register. Um, then you compare this one to, uh, to what you expect to be, in that, to be at that memory location. If it's not what you expect, then the compare and set operation fails. Uh, you just set the return value and you, you return from wherever you were called. Um, if it is what, it, what you expect, then you conditionally uh, then you conditionally store back the A2 value, the, the new desired value uh, on that memory location. And this store conditional will only succeed if in the meantime, no other hardware thread uh, wrote to that same memory location. Um, so basically what, what, what you get back as this T0 is uh, zero if it succeeded um, and you get back an error value in case something went wrong. That something went wrong can either be that somebody else updated the value or it is also permitted to fail for spurious reasons for a couple of times. And then uh, what, what happens? So if it's not zero, then you jump back to the beginning and you just retry that loop again. So you already see maybe a potential problem here. Uh, we have a while loop and we keep retrying things. This potentially smells like an infinite loop. And that's exactly one of the main, uh, main arguments that are brought forward against this, uh, uh, these loops is that um, basically the, the ISA has to, be, has to make very sure that there is a forward, guarantee prog uh, forward progress guarantee. So um, basically there are some conditions laid out in the, in the ISA and the specification that say, if your, if your loop complies to those requirements, then the microarchitecture implementing risk five has to make sure that at some point, one of the following things happens, where one of the following things is, for example, that you exit out of the loop because it succeeded. Uh, but basically this is in order to, um, to prevent an infinite loop happening in all cores because they are some, somehow ping-ponging things uh, back and forth and never actually making progress. And basically the ISA has to make guarantees um, of how to avoid this possibility. Um, yeah, and for example, one of the things is that the instructions, the, number, the, the amount of instructions and also which instructions you can use between the load and the store is restricted. So you cannot use everything in between this uh, load reduced, uh, load reserved and the store conditional um, instruction. There, there is restrictions on what you can do in there. Branching out forward is, is in the failure cases, for example, one of them that is guaranteed uh, to not violate this forward progress guarantee. Okay, so that was atomic instructions. Then of course, so far we've, yeah, okay. Uh, Bernhard, you have a question? Bernhard? I see your hand up. Can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, sorry, I had the wrong uh, microphone uh, configured. 
Um, so for the store conditional, uh, you said that if uh, some hardware thread uh, writes to the value in the meantime, then this is uh, detected. So this means that the hardware can detect Detect the ABA problem. So if the value that you loaded with the with the load reserve, if that would have been changed by a different thread to a different value, but then changed back by another thread to the original value, the hardware could detect that. Yes, excellent point. That is actually one of the one of the, that is part of the of the rationale why actually LR, LRSC loops are more powerful than the compare and swap instructions. Yes, because it can contact it can detect and correctly deal with ABA problems without you requiring to do extra gymnastics of adding a generation count or something. Yes. That, that's awesome. Thank you. Very good point. OK, so, so far we've only been talking about integers. There are more than integers in the world. So we get the F extensions. We get 32 new registers. Hey, uh, so F zero to F31, uh, they are all 32 bits wide and they can contain single precision floating point numbers. Uh, you get 26 or 30 new instructions, uh, load store, uh, floating point computations. Uh, there you actually see that the square root is part of the, of the F extension. So square root you get basically with the basic F extensions already. Uh, we have fused multiplayer add instructions. We have conversion to from integers. With 32-bit, you, of course, only get them to 32-bit integers. With RV64, you also get them to 64-bit integers. Uh, we have sign injection instructions. Um, we have something to uh, move the bit pattern, or the floating point bit pattern, to general integer registers to then do something with it. And we have uh, three compare and one classify instruction. I'd also like to point out that, uh, basically, uh, as I, mean, I didn't mention it for the base ISA, there is no move instructions. There is no move instruction to, um, to move between registers. How do you move register between integer registers? Well, you just add zero, just add an, do an immediate add of zero between and then move it to a different destination register. How do you move uh, floating point numbers? You actually do a copy sign with, the, with both uh, input registers being the same, and then you have the output register. So you copy sign of the number, the same sign that you, the number already has, so eventually you move it. So again, they are getting around adding an extra instruction that is actually not needed, and that the assembler can actually, like if you type fmov in the, in the assembly code, the assembler can just translate this into the sign, effect, uh, sign injection of the same source uh, instruction of the same source register. Okay, so there's more than signal precision. So the D extension uh, just extends everything to 64 bits. Uh, there is some clever boxing to make sure that if there is a single precision value in uh, the register and you try to read it back as a double precision, you get not a number back. Uh, and then other than that, you just get the, the same instructions for double precision. Uh, with the only exception that you get also conversion instructions to and from single precision values, which of course makes sense. Oh yeah, and the instructions to move bit patterns only works on RV64 because we have 64 bit, uh, 64 -bit numbers, so we cannot move this into 32 bit registers on, on RV32. Um, otherwise you'd have to go by choir memory. Okay, so we already now had a couple of extensions, so at some point that's getting a bit nasty. Um, so, so that's also what the what the uh, what the what the what the hardware architectures uh, architect architects thought. Um, so we have the G general purpose ISA extension. So basically, this is just an abbreviation of all the standard extensions that are presented so far. So we have I the base M A F D. And then we have two more that won't go into detail. So there is a control and status register. Basically, that's for cycle and timing counters, hardware performance counters, uh, and floating point uh, exception state. And then um, uh, instruction fetch fence. So if you're doing, for example, jitting, that's something maybe you have to get, uh, you have to pay attention to. But other than that, G is just an abbreviation for that thing there. Um, and also note in the future, those profiles are maybe uh, taking over some of that. 
uh, in, a, in a more flexible way. So we don't have to come up with, with more individual letters, but we basically have a way of, of, um, of grouping together base and mandatory extensions. And I expect that those profiles are going to be more important in that sense. Okay, so one of the traditional, um, let's say, weak points of risk architectures is that, I, so I said that the risk architectures, they try to make uh, simpler instructions. So maybe you need more instructions in order to, to do the same job instead of you just having one instruction that does maybe a couple of operations behind your back. Um, so maybe you need more instructions. And then also because a risk five chooses a, a constant 32 bit encoding, um, your code is actually getting quite long. So the C extension gets us compressed instructions. So for the most commonly used instructions, we have 16 bit encoding. So we need only half the space and we lower the code alignment uh, requirements for 32 bit encoding. So basically this means uh, we can freely mix compressed and uncompressed instructions, no matter how, as long as they are aligned on a two byte boundary, everything is fine and the processor somehow has to deal with it. Um, and that makes the code quite a bit denser. So how does it do that? I mean, if it just fits, like if everything fitted, fit into 16 bit, you wouldn't need the 16, uh, the 32 bit. So we have to make some trade off somewhere. Uh, and the trade offs are that, um, Either the trade-off is for um, small immediate, so immediate numbers that you encode into the instruction or small address offsets. So for example, if you only have a very close by jump out of the loop or uh, if you have uh, for, for if conditions or something like this, maybe you can get away with a smaller, uh, with a smaller jump. Uh, then maybe the compressed instructions are still able to compress, uh, are, are still able to encode the same, um, uh, the same content, let's say. Or there are also restrictions on the registers. So um, there are some special registers um, according to this calling con to, to a calling convention. Uh, so for example, there are special instructions to uh, spill con to spill variables uh, relative to the stack to the stack pointer. Um, so there's the stack pointer is, is uh, as a convention, I think is in, in the X2 register. So there's a special instruction that always operates relative to the X2 register. Um, or there are uh, all the most popular ones or so most popular ones just by some definition, I think it's X8 to X15 or so. So if some of those are true, uh, then you can use the compressed instruction uh, and is it worth it? So according to the standard, 50 to 60% of RISC-V instructions in a program can be replaced with RVCs or RISC-V compressed instructions, resulting in 25 to 30% code size reduction. So that's quite a bit. And the nice thing is that uh, the compressed instructions are not added as an, as an afterthought, but they, are, they were explicitly from the beginning part of the, uh, of the plan. Um, which means that there are no some, so for example, ARM had some in the beginning had some funny uh, things for compressed instructions, which made it pretty, uh, pretty hard for the compiler sometimes. Uh, so that's a lot better with RISC-V also because it's a new one. So they learned from the past mistakes, of course. Um, so there are more uh, quad precision floating point, bit manipulations, uh, then the vector operation, I will, I will come back to that. Um, and some more, uh, half precision floating point, uh, floating point in integer registers, there's also a standard, uh, standard extension for doing that. Uh, then there is a subset if you only need multiplication but don't need integer division. Maybe for some em embedded device, you want to have multiplication, but maybe you don't need the division. Uh, and then there are also extensions for hypervisor and supervisor. So if you want to use virtualization, that's also defined as part of, a, uh, of an extension. Um, yeah, just to, to finish this part of going into the ISA, um, just to, to understand a bit the naming so that if you come across something, you know uh, what it is about. So, um, so the, the base is I or E for integer or embedded. Uh, then for standard ISA extensions, you have single letters. So M, A, F, D, for example, that we already saw, or you have the Z prefix followed by an alphabetical name. 
And then the convention is that the second letter is the closest standard extensions to it. So for example, uh, the control status registers, they are kind of close to the base ISA. So they, are, they have an I half precision floating point. Okay, that's close to, to floating point. So we have ZFH. Uh, so just to give a bit of uh, an order in that, in that naming. And then the very interesting part of RISC-V is that it actually has um, part of the 32-bit encoding space uh, intentionally left free and actually with a guarantee that standard extensions will never occupy this space. And this is meant for vendors to come along and say, look, we have want uh, a processor that is especially good, especially good for doing some special operations in what we sell the customer to do. And it would be so nice and so much more energy efficient and more performant if we could have that instruction. And then they can just go and create a non-standard extension. Um, so uh, those are named with an X and then an alphabetical name. And the tool chains said, uh, so Clang and GCC came together and said, look, we don't want complete chaos to be here. So we expect uh, it to start with a vendor name. So for example, we have X Ventana, which is a company uh, for conditional operations. And we have, for example, already various X T hat, which is another company, and then some, some descriptive name after that. Um, so basically X, that is the non-standard extensions that maybe vendors came up to speed up a, a specific application part. And that uh, the, the Z prefix is for, for standard extensions. Okay, so that's it for the for for a tour through the ISA. Uh, as I said, there's of course a lot more, and uh, for full full glorious details, you have to go read the standard. Uh, but I hope I have at least a bit of an overview. Are there any questions? So, given that this is already is a ten years process, and uh, and um, is supposed to be as future proof as possible. Yep. Um, have there been are there already examples where um, where you know mistakes were made and people thought, ah, you know, if we, if we, if you know did this differently, that would have been much better. Yeah, um, yeah, you actually find some, and they are actually spelled out in the standard. Uh, so the the most uh, the first that comes to mind is that um, so for for comparisons, you need basically three operators, right? You need, I mean, you need some greater equal, you need some greater, and you need equal. And then less than or less than equal, you can just synthesize by, by swapping things around. And the interesting thing is that, um, so I think the, the base ISA, but I have to look up those things, they, it has uh, branch greater equals, branch less than, and branch equals. But the F extensions, they have greater equals, greater than, and equals. So they have basically one has less than and the other one has greater than. Um, which is, I mean, a minor annoyance because that's the compiler that's supposed to take care of that. Um, the other thing that I remember is, um, there was some other thing that is also spelled out in the, in the standard. Um, but then how, how is it being dealt with? I mean, is there a new version of the standard and uh, you have uh, either, you know, version two CPU or version one, or this is a mistake which just stays there forever. And that's I, it. I, I think for now the, the, it's expected to just stay there. Uh, so the, there's not going to be, there's not, um, it's going to be backwards compatible. So it's not going to change. That's at least my understanding. And the compiler has to take care of it basically. Um, yeah, I, I don't remember the second one. There's, there's another one that, uh, Yep. Any other questions? If not, then I will go to the risk five vector extensions, uh, which of course is fitting for the, for the computer accelerator forum and potentially, I mean, very interesting for, for anything that needs performance out of it. Um, so as a motivation, um, I was at the risk five European summit in Barcelona in, in June. Um, and now I'm terribly sorry for the joke I have to make, but uh, can it run Doom? So can RISC-V run Doom? Uh, the answer is yes, but actually if, you, if I talk to um, 
uh, if you talk to the semi dynamics, uh, so that it's a vendor um, that sells uh, intellectual property course. So you basically can go there and license it. Um, and they say, as a, as a marketing in, in their booth, they said that's not the right question. The question is, can it run Boom faster with the risk five vector extensions? And according to them, the answer is yes. So that's uh, a picture that I took there. Um, so what you see here is, so it's two uh, PCs with FPGAs in them. So it's not risk five hardware that exists. And on the left, they just disabled the vector unit. On the right, it's enabled. And then they run Doom on both. Um, and on the left, uh, you get 6.8 frames per second. And on the right, you get 22 frames per second. Couple of caveats. So first, it's FPGAs. So it's not actual hardware. It's running at 25 megahertz. So that's OK. Um, and then we are, of course, very early on um, in, the, in the optimization process. So is the hardware already fully optimized? Is the software already fully optimized? And also what, they, what the engineers did is they just went to the source code and placed, in, placed vector intrinsics in there. Uh, I mean, sure, you can make things fast by placing intrinsics in there. Um, but I mean, as a marketing gig, I think it was, was quite funny and uh, shows maybe the motivation of why maybe RISC-V vector extensions are something, something interesting uh, to, to take a look at. Um, so before we take actually look at the at the vector extensions, I'd first like to take a quick look at the at the SIMD extension that we have in other ISAs. So that then afterwards I can uh, kind of highlight what are the important design decisions that are different for the risk five vector extensions. Um, so what is SIMD? So SIMD is single instruction multiple data uh, that is to exploit data level parallelism. So as an example, you're adding elements of two vectors together and storing it in a third one. So that is data level parallelism because all the individual additions, they are independent of each other. Um, and if you have an instruction, a single instruction that can work on multiple data, that is SIMD. Um, there are already SIMD extensions of the current ISA. So in x86, we have SSE, uh, we have AVX. Uh, on ARM, there's NEON. It's basically the same thing. It's, I think, 128 bits on ARM. Um, Okay, so it exists. Um, let's look at some code. Uh, so the, the standard example of a vectorizable loop is the AX plus Y. So we have A, a scalar, and X and Y vectors. And we scale the one vector and add it to the other one, and then store it back to the Y vector. Uh, that's how the C code looks like if you want to implement in C code. Uh, the Clang pragmas are just there in order to shorten the produce assembly code. Um, uh, so I could take it away. It's basically just saying the compiler, look, this is safe to vectorize, and please don't uh, don't unroll the loop before uh, before you're generating vector instructions. And that's what it spits out. Okay, that's a bit of lie. There is a bit of setup code above that that I that I removed, and I gave some meaningful labels to the to the parts. Uh, but basically, what the compiler generates is it generates some vectorized loop uh, that in this case. Uh, loads x, multiplies with a, loads y, computes ax plus y, and then stores back y, and then does a bit of pointer arithmetic, um, and then just loops as long as there are um, as there are vectorized um, as, as there are elements left that it can be processed by the vectorized loop, and basically so those are SSE instructions for XMM, and it's single precision, so we can process four single precision floats in in one instruction. I think, unless, but for us, for us, it's single precision. Single precision should be four. It should be 128 bits. So divided by, by 32, that should be four elements. So, um, but maybe you, your, your vector is, 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 is not a multiple of, of four elements. So you also have to have a scalar remainder loop uh, that with scalar instructions takes, uh, takes care of the remaining instructions. Okay. Um, so that, I mean that works. That's what the compiler gives you if you compile for uh, with optimization for x86 uh, 64 bit. Nice. Um, so what are the potential issues with those SIMD instruction set extensions for multimedia? Because that's where it originally came from. Um, that's of course like the slide may be a bit biased because it's according to computer architecture a quantitative approach, which is a standard textbook by Hennessy. 
and Patterson, that's the same Patterson again. And Hennessy is actually um, is a professor from the Stanford University. Uh, that's the person or was the principal investigator for the creation of the MIPS architecture. So that's the second uh, very influential at the beginning uh, risk instruction set architecture. And they wrote this textbook together, which is basically a classics for computer architecture. So what are the problems according to them? Um, first, uh, fixed size registers. So you need new instruction for larger vectors. And I mean, I put the names for x86 here. So in the beginning we had MMX, which was multimedia extensions, uh, which just repurposed the 64-bit floating point registers to uh, process multiple, um, in that case, um, integers together. Then we had SSE, 128 bits. Then we had AVX, five, uh, 256 bits. Then we have AVX 512, which is 512 bits. With a small caveat, it actually, five, I know AVX 512 also has instructions to work on 128 and 256 bits. But basically we end up, if you want to increase the, 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 the register size, you end up creating new instructions. Okay, there's a partial solution for this, which ARM has recently, um, standardized uh, is the ARM scalable vector extension. So you have scalable vector registers. So the, the length of the register is not, um, is not an ISA property anymore, but basically is implementation defined and can change from processor to processor. If there is an instruction in order to, sorry, um, there's an instruction in order to ask the hardware, what is the vector size that is currently available? So at least with this way, you get around creating new instructions every time. Uh, but still, a somewhat related problem to this is um, how do you deal with vectors that are not multiples of the of the register size? Um, so if you have a register that fits um, eight, uh, let's say eight uh, eight floats maybe in AVX, um, and you have nine elements, you somehow have to deal with that single one that's left over. The traditional approach, as I showed before, is a scalar remainder loop, which is fine for small vector for small SIMD extensions. I mean, if you process like three iterations with a scalar loop, that's maybe fine. Um, masking and predication, so basically disabling some of the vector lanes can help in, uh, in SVE and also in AVX 512, I think also introduced that. But actually there's a more natural solution for this problem, which was developed in the 1960s, 1970s and used in the famous Cray-1 uh, supercomputer. And that is uh, to have a proper vector processor and this vector processor having uh, a vector length register set by the application. So the hardware of course has some, has some fixed size register, but then the application can say, I want to use only a part of that register. And then the hardware will take care of basically ignoring the rest, uh, what comes after. Um, so setting this vector length register then determines the lengths of the following vector operations that are, uh, that are in the program context. Okay, so now we have all the background to start talking about the V standard extensions for vector operations. Uh, in short, it's RVV, so risk five V vector extensions. I don't know how many Vs you want in there. Um, so let's start, what do we get? First, we get more registers, perfect. So we already have 32 integer registers, then we have 32 floating point registers, and then now we get another 32 vector registers named V0 to V31. And it's taking the same approach as SVE. So the, um, the length is fixed, but it's not, by the IS, it's not fixed by the ISA, but by the hardware implementation. So the hardware designers, they say, okay, look, we want to have vector registers of size 256 bits. And then this is fixed for the for the for the state of the what the registers can actually hold. And what the application then has to do is has to configure uh, what the standard what the extension calls vector type. Uh, so the first thing it has to select the element with. So basically, this is how do you interpret the data? Like where is the boundary of individual elements? Um, of course, the hardware has to support it. So the hardware has like which ELANG it supports. And then uh, out, of it, uh, out of that, you select one and that is then the selected element with, so SEW for short. And um, what RISC-V 
what, what RVV also has is a register group multiplier, LMAL, um, which basically says that you can group multiple registers together to form a longer vector register group. So if you say LMAL equals eight, uh, you group, you form four groups of eight registers. So you have uh, vector registers V0 to V7 virtually concatenated then eight to 15 concatenated, then 16 to 30, or 16 to, I can't math, uh, something, and then the last eight ones together. Um, so of course, if you have L mal equals one, then you have 32. If you have L mal equals eight, then you have only four vector register groups that you can use. Uh, was a question or? Can you make one or less 30 million? No, so L mal equals eight is the maximum right now. So you're guaranteed always to get at least four out of it still. Um, of course, that can change maybe in a later standard version. And for the full fun of it, uh, L mal can actually also be a fractional value. Uh, I have personally not fully understood it myself yet, so I'm not going to talk about this today. Um, and after you've configured this, basically uh, you can figure out, so the vector length, as I said, is, is not known for the ISA, it's a property of the, of the implementation, uh, but it's guaranteed to be less than two to the 16. Uh, and with this, you can then calculate the number, the number of elements that you can have in one register, uh, in one, what's it called, vector register group. Uh, so you have the, length of the register in bits divided by the element width in bits times the, the multiplier. And basically the way it works out is that um, this can be at least two, or this is at maximum is two to the 16. So that makes sure that software can expect that indices into this fit into 16 bits, uh, which makes uh, some encodings apparently a bit easier. And now we get back to what I said in the previous one, which is the solution of how you can vector program without a remainder loop is then there is the uh, VL, the vector length register, which must be smaller than the maximum number of elements that you can put into the register. And that is something that the application can influence. So that is something that the application says for the next few vector instructions, I want to use that many elements. So how does it do that? Um, there is three instructions for configuration. We just take a look at one. Um, so we have as the source, uh, uh, as one of the source registers, uh, we have the so-called application vector length. So that's basically the number of uh, elements that the application has left to process. Um, and then we have the, uh, the V type, so the, the vector type, uh, basically what I had in the previous slide, the, the element and the multiplication factor. And then you execute this instruction and what the, uh, what the processor gives you back in the destination register is what is the new value of this vector length register according to some constraints and according to the, the application vector length that you asked for. So just a short example. Um, so A0 is the number of, of elements. E32 means you select 32 bit uh, width of the of, of every element. Uh, M8 means you choose a multiplication. Um, I forgot what it's called. You choose uh, eight registers per, per vector group. Um, and then TA, MMA, I won't get to. And then TA, so uh, it's not TA, T0, yeah, that's supposed to say T0, is assigned the newly set uh, vector length. Um, the value of the newly assigned vector length register, which is of course smaller than num maximum number of, uh, of elements that you can have in the register. And of course, also smaller than what you asked for and some additional constraints that I won't go into detail today. So that's the configuration. And then you have, I, I didn't put all of them because it's, it's many instructions that you can actually work on those registers. Uh, so configuration setting option instructions I had on the previous, those are three. Then you have vector load and store instructions with units tried, with strided access, with indexed access, uh, with index unordered access. You have some, uh, some, some special load instructions. Uh, if you don't know how much data you can actually read from the memory location. 
then you have arithmetic instructions for integer, for fixed point, actually for fixed point decimals, uh, for floating points and for vector reduction operations. So if you can say, I want to get the sum of all elements in that, in that vector register. Um, and also mask instruction and permutation instructions. Um, I don't know all of them, it's long. Um, you'll probably find what you need in there. So let's look at some more assembly code. Um, so that's actually copied from the standard. So that is handwritten assembly code this time. It's not coming from the, from the compiler. So how does this work in practice? So the same, uh, the same routine as before. So we are again doing uh, a scalar, which is in the FA0 register, uh, X, which is a vector, we have an address, uh, Y, which is another address, uh, and then we do the, the computation to compute AX plus Y. So what do we do? We call this configuration instruction. We say we have A0, so in the beginning, that is the number of elements that you have in the reg, uh, in the, in the, um, that you are supposed to work on. Um, you say, okay, we have single precision, so 32 bits. We want to use as long of a vector register group as we can. Um, please hardware tell us how many elements we are supposed to process in this loop. And that's then returned in the A4 register. Uh, then we load from X and actually this vector instruction will now implicitly use the vector length. So th this will load A4 elements from the, vector, from the address A1. So load A4 elements of X into the vector register V0 until V7 because we, we formed a group of eight registers. Um, then we subtract the number of elements that we are just processing. Uh, we do a bit of shifting. Um, then we load Y, same instruction. Um, we load it into V8 until V15. V uh, then we do the, multi uh, the fuse multiply accumulate uh, with the uh, vector X and the vector Y and the scalar A, and then we store it back into Y. Um, and basically this is now uh, transformed into a while loop more or less. Uh, so as long as we have elements in A0, so remember we subtracted the number of elements that we, that we processed, as long as we have elements left, we just jump, jump to the beginning and just do the same thing again. And at some point we processed all elements. So at some point A4 will be exactly A0. So this subtraction will get us zero in A0. And then this branch not equals will not be taken and we return from the function. We have processed all vector elements and we have stored back all the results into the Y vector. So the thing to notice here um, is that there is no remainder loop. We only have a vector loop. We only tell the hardware, I have that many elements left and the hardware is supposed to figure out in which chunks uh, it's, it's, it's going to process this. There are some rules for this, um, but in the end, we just tell the hardware, this is the vectors we have. This is the instructions that we want to do with this. We want to load it, we want to load it, we want to accumulate it, we want to store it. Please do whatever you want with the, with, the, with the vector length and then just process these instructions with that vector length. Okay, so as I said, that was handwritten assembly code. Uh, that probably is, is at least, if you have already done it, manual vectorization is, is tedious, time consuming, error prone. Uh, so if possible, it would be nice if the compiler can do this for us. Um, auto vectorization has improved a lot, works well for easy cases, also for this very simple AX plus Y, uh, might need some help for more complex cases um, and might even not be possible for the, for the most advanced cases. Um, so Clang has already support for RVV10, so for the ratified um, version of it. So let's see what we get. Uh, so this is the compiler, of the, the compilation output for 64 GC. So no vector extensions yet, and you just get scalar code. It didn't take the effort to annotate this. You, lay, you load X and Y, you multiply at them, you store it back, you do the loop, you go back, scalar loop. It's pretty, pretty straightforward to, to, uh, to, to, to understand what's happening here. 
Now we do the same with uh, vector extensions enabled with Clang. And yes, that's going to be a bit longer. Uh, I'm not going to go through this. If you want, I've, I've annotated the, the, the assembly listing with what is happening uh, and also gave meaningful labels. Um, the important thing to notice here is that um, this instruction here gets the vector byte length. So there's the, uh, the architectural V length. So how long is your vector register divided by eight? Then we divide it by another four. So we get the number of floats. And what is happening after is we are basically uh, using this with a fixed size register length. Um, maybe I go, ah, it's here. Uh, so we call this configuration function and we say zero as the, as the application vector length. And that's a special case that just says, give me the maximum that is suitable for this, uh, for this element type. Uh, so then we have a vectorized loop, um, and then we actually have a scalar remainder loop. So that's the code that you get out of the compiler right now. The big caveat, of course, is <clears throat> uh, the vector extensions are still quite new. Um, so it's rather encouraging to see compiler support already and actually something which is vectorized, which is coming out of it. Um, as I said, it's using the fixed size register, uh, the, the, the fixed size vector sizes. <clears throat> um, I personally think that the likely reason is that this way of using it matches basically what the ARM scalable vector extensions are doing. And that code was already upstream. So probably they just reused that. Um, so the scalar remainder loop, of course, I mean, it works. Um, that's what the compilers have been doing for the past years of, optimi of, of compiling for SIMD uh, extensions. Probably it does not yield optimal performance. And especially the bigger the vector our registers are getting, the longer our scalar, uh, our scalar remainder is at, at some point going to be. Um, but I mean, that's still work in progress. So I expect at some point the compiler will maybe generate um, better code, at least for those simple examples where you can exactly understand and trans more or less transform this for loop into a while I have elements to process left. Okay, so just one, uh, one slide of conclusion uh, before we get into the question, I'm also running late. Um, so RISC-V is an open standard ISA, so you actually can go download the spec. Vendors can go uh, create cores without paying anything to, to a company as they need to do for ARM. Um, it is modular, which is very interesting. I mean, today I presented the, the standard extensions, which are important for general purpose, um, general purpose chips or general purpose processors. But if the vendor wants to have something specific for a specific application area, um, that is possible. That is possible and explicitly, um, let's say helped by the RISC-V ISA uh, standardization as it is right now. Uh, the vector extensions are, in my opinion, very interesting. They have a couple of interesting design decisions. Uh, so especially having, being able to write portable code for larger vectors that will actually also perform good because it's up to the, uh, to the, to the, to the architecture to uh, kind of do some of the strip mining or some of the chunking. I personally think that's very interesting. I already heard that some vendor, like some, some chip designers don't like it because the standard like RISC-V vector extensions are quite uh, complex. Um, probably implementing this in hardware is maybe not the easiest task to do. Uh, but I mean, I'm a software person, so for me that is interesting. Um, the first single board computers with RISC-V are there. Uh, so in addition to all of the million to billion chips that they already have as embedded um, uh, with, for embedded use cases, they are now also the first single board computers um, that can just boot a regular Linux, maybe a Debian. Uh, so for example, the Division 5. Uh, sadly, there is no hardware with RISC-V, so RVV 1.0 yet. There is some hardware with the older, with an older draft version of the standard uh, 0 0.71. Um, so at some point, this is hopefully going to change. And uh, hopefully some vendors will at some point sell hardware that has the, the final ratified version. Um, I don't know how performant it is, is going to be. Um, I don't know if, if it will like conquer the world and completely replace x86, maybe not. Uh, but at least from, from looking at the vector extensions, I personally find it very interesting. 
Yeah, and I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Uh, any questions? Remote, I see Attila, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. I have a super naive question, uh, but just to even show my my uh, how much I, I don't know about uh, this topic. So you uh, you described multiple times with vector instructions how uh, the normally the assembly code that people generate would would have a scalar remainder part. But what I kept wondering about all the time was that. Uh, are scalar instructions that much faster than vector instructions? Or why don't we just uh, run one additional vector instruction with some of the uh, register, well, the parts of the register being in an undefined state? Um, um, again, very naive question. So you mean basically for, for this one, for the x86 SSE instructions? Um, so my understanding is, maybe somebody has to correct me that it's wrong, but SSE basically doesn't allow, doesn't have predication. So you can always only do four elements. And then uh, you run into trouble because you're not, like the compiler is not allowed to uh, load elements that the original C code didn't want to load. So it cannot just load past the array. So if, if, there are only, if there's only two elements left, you cannot just load elements uh, at, at, at index two and three, that's not, that's not allowed. Um, so then you would have to kind of um, load them individually depending on the number and then put them into the correct, in, into the correct vector, into the correct um, SSE register at the correct place. And then at some point it's not worth it anymore to then use the, uh, the packed uh, multiplication and addition. That's at least my, my understanding. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I have to assume that for some reason, uh, this is faster than trying to force the additional vectorized instruction. But, okay. Yeah, so um, as I said, so with uh, AVX 512, with predication, you can just predicate the, you can just mask off the, the last elements that you don't have. Or at some point uh, during AVX times before AVX 512 is for the predication, there was even the idea that you, uh, if you vectorize with, uh, SS, with AVX, and then you have maybe three elements left, three double precision elements left, then you just do one iteration of an SSE vectorized loop, and then you go back to the scalar loop. But I mean, it's blowing up the code immensely. And then if you would do this for AVX 512, okay, you would have the main loop with 512 bits, then you have an AVX loop with 256 bits, and that's not going to scale at some point. Um, but yes, for bigger vector registers, I mean, also, Statistically speaking, the number of, of leftover elements or remainder elements is going to grow. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Any more questions? I have one. Yeah. The, uh, so if I understand correctly, the, the maximum width of the that the standard defines for the for the vector registers is two to the sixteen. Yes, correct. So, doing the math, this would fit a thousand twenty four doubles. I I just made. The uh, quick, uh, I, I just put it on the. Okay. Yeah. So two, do, two, do you know? Oh, yeah, two, anyway, two, it's, two it's, to it's, the six. It's yes. huge. It's yes, huge. it's huge. And uh, I mean, uh, you can you can yeah, you have a uh, thousand twenty four doubles in one register. Then you have times eight yeah. because you can group them together. So it's quite some, yes. Do you know anybody trying in this direction already? Well, I, I mean, mean, not for, with, not not maybe the maximum, but not uh, not but, but not, not going, for risk, going beyond not, not for risk five. Well. But I mean, in the past, vector register vector computers were exactly that. Yeah. I mean, they had like up to thirty thousand uh, doubles or flow, maybe single precision at that point still. Uh, in one vector register. So it's not unheard of, okay. but I mean, today, no, I'm not aware. I mean, I'm not even aware of, I mean, I know that, so Sci-5 has, has an implementation with 128 bits, I think. Um, I've seen some talking about 256 bits uh, okay. per register. I mean, for now we are not getting close that two to the 16 
um, two to the 16 just now is right now is the maximum that you can encode in the instruction. So after that, you would need a new extension. <laughs> okay, thanks. Any more questions? Yeah, maybe just one. So I, I remembered what, what Jakob asked. Uh, I remembered the, the other thing that is that is uh, confusing in the standard. Um, I, I said that there are uh, fused multiply add instructions for the floating points, and they are extremely confusing. They have extremely confusing names. So basically, um, they do the opposite of what the x86 names say they do. <laughs> because they are modeled after the MIPS instruction sets uh, or what, what the MIPS instructions had, but they're also not doing it the way that the MIPS instruction do it. So for sign zeros, they do something else. Uh, so basically they do a hybrid, but they do neither what MIPS did nor what x86 did. And it's extremely confusing. Luckily, that's only for the compilers to figure out. Um, and I mean, you can always look up what the instruction is doing, but uh, that's another thing. And I think even in the standard, they say, look, the naming is maybe not, not the best thing that we did. About the, about the negation in, in, in uh, fused multiplayer. Could you make a, a comment about the status of the compilers? You mentioned Silang and uh, also something about GCC. So yes. it's been the last years, and uh, how does that uh, uh, transfer to the OS level? I mean, is it just Linux right now? No, so there's also, I think FreeBSD also has support for it, uh, NetBSD or one of the other BSDs as well. Um, and then of course, some of the, um, of the embedded systems, of course, of the embedded OS. Uh, I think FreeRTOS has it. Um, uh, I don't know if open WRT already has it for, for routers in principle. Um, yeah, so that's the that's the operating system part for compilers. Yeah, so GCC since 7.1 um, has at least the base thing uh, and Clang also has it. Um, the thing is, of course, um, there's now always a catch up race between hardware designers coming up with new extensions and compilers getting support for those new extensions. Uh, I think um, so Clang has a pretty or LVM has a pretty nice overview of what they are implementing and they're actually pretty, pretty good at implementing it. Um, I also met uh, the, the code owner in Barcelona. He's, he's super um, He's doing, I think, an excellent job at, at following up. So they also have the bit manipulation already. They have some experimental stuff in there. Um, they have some of the vendor extensions even in the in the in the in the in the LVM and compiler. Um, then of course the question is, does it does it produce optimal code? I guess the answer right now is no. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's it's going to to mature over time. Um, so there are still things where maybe it's not generating the best idioms possible that the microarchitectures can can detect and optimize on, uh, that's going to take time. But it's still really good that you have two of them, the big yes. ones, and yes. uh, it's the intermediate tool to the software world. So if that goes on, yes. it will be adopted more as a technology, I mean. Yes. Um, the building blocks are all there. That's, I think, the, the strong point there, yes. Okay, I don't see any more questions. So thanks again to Jonas for the very interesting talk. And uh, yeah, see you again for the next Computer Accelerator Forum in, in October.